Oh, I'm going to hit this record button. Uh, welcome to uh, our Q&A session for today. Um, it's good to see you guys. Uh, I love talking to you. And um, actually, uh, before we get started, I want you to get familiar with the chat, <clears throat> um, kind of look around, put your question. If you have any questions, put them in the Q&A section. And uh, if you want to chat with each other, uh, you can put that in the chat section. So if you put your question in the chat, I won't see it. But if you put it in the Q&A section, I will see it. And I'm only going to answer the questions for those of you who are in the Zoom webinar who are who put your question in the Q&A section. Um, the one thing I want to mention to you guys uh, before we forget is that uh, don't forget that we are teaching a master class on stock options. Uh, a lot of you asked me to do a master class on options. So I put one together for you. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of everything you ever wanted to know about stock options and how they work and all everything else. We get started on uh, July 8th. And so um, because you're here at this session, uh, we I've made available the 48% off discount code that actually expired uh, a couple of days ago. But uh, there's one code you can use uh, for today only. Uh, you can uh, use the code, uh, go to drboysmasterclass.com, use the code July 2020. July 2020 is the code that's one word, not two, drboysmasterclass.com. Somebody type drboysmasterclass.com in the chat and then put in the code July 2020. Remember, July 2020 is one word, not two words. Okay. All right. So let's, let's get started. First thing I want to talk to you guys about is something that was uh, on my mind about, you know, uh, building building economies and building a black Wall Street. You know, a lot of uh, there's a lot of discussion right now about you know blackness and everybody kind of loves black people right now. And you know, and end up uh, you know a couple years ago nobody liked us. You know, nobody wanted to hear stuff that I was talking about. I've been talking about this stuff for many years, and the resistance was unbelievable. I mean, when you go talking about black wealth. People think that you're being racist or you talk about black people supporting black businesses. People think that that's racist. I mean, I, I used to get a lot of resistance on that. Uh, when you talk about uh, things like uh, black people owning businesses, I'd hear people say, oh, everybody, everybody can't be an entrepreneur. And I say, yeah, but everybody ain't meant to work for a white person either. So just let's not forget that everybody's not meant to work for a white person either. And uh, unfortunately, we kill a lot of our best entrepreneurs. Uh, and then also, uh, when you talk about black people educating our own, just controlling our own, building our own, a lot of people have always thought that would, that to be impossible. Um, I know it's not impossible. The reason I always knew it wasn't impossible is because I see white people do it every day. Uh, but the reason I know it's not impossible is because I see Asian communities doing it every day. You know, the reason I know it's not impossible is because I see Jewish communities doing it every day. I see Arab communities doing it every day. I see everybody else doing it every day. And so when you sit there and you see something that white people are doing every day and you tell me that that's impossible for black people to do. I mean, think about this. You got black folks. Tell me if you know what I'm talking about. You got black people out here that will tell you that it's not possible for black people to build their own. Well, you ain't got nothing. You ain't got enough. Da -da -da. So they're literally telling you that it's impossible for you to do something that white people do every day. Well, you may not know this or not, but that is a form of white supremacy. White supremacy is when you put white people on an elevated pedestal. White supremacy is when you inherently believe that white people are better than black people. You know, white supremacy is when you believe white people are uh, superior, that they have more skill, more capability, et cetera. So when you um, see something white people do every day and you say that it's not possible for black people to do it, then you are a white supremacist. Or when you tell a black person that, uh, that they're supposed to send their children to white schools to be educated because black people are too stupid to do it, you are a white supremacist. And so I, I really kind of want us to really expand the definition of what a white supremacist is. White supremacy is not just an issue because white people feel that way. White supremacy is a bigger issue because black people feel that way. There are many black people who believe that a white business is superior to a black business. There are many white black people who believe that a white school is superior to a black school. There are many black people who believe that there are things that white people do every single day that black people cannot, can never do. And so uh, one of the things that I, I really love right now is that everybody's talking about, you know, blackness and black people and black power and, and everything else. And, uh, and I love the energy. I love what they're trying to do. Uh, but the thing is, I want to make sure that we don't do it wrong. Uh, you know, so for example, uh, there is, uh, you know, Netflix, uh, the CEO of Netflix announced that he's given $120 billion, excuse me, $120 million to HBCUs, which I think is great. And he's also going to give $100 million to black run organizations, which I think is also great. He also hired a black woman as, you know, the head of marketing, which I think is great. Um, I, I'm sure they're going to do some black content and create, you know, opportunities for some black directors and producers and all that, which I think is, I think that's great too. But 
at the same time, you must also remember though, that while Netflix is allowing, uh, you know, black folks to uh, get some of their money, they're also stopping black people from, um, you know, getting certain other opportunities that we may want from Netflix. So for example, uh, Louis Farrakhan was supposed to have a documentary on Netflix and Netflix basically said, we're not gonna, we don't approve of Farrakhan as your, as a black leader. We don't, we're not endorsing that. We're not supporting that, right? Uh, we, we decide who your black leaders are gonna be. So we wanna go get somebody that we think is more acceptable. We're gonna go get Billy Porter, the guy who wears dresses on Sesame Street, and that's gonna be a black leader. Like, you know, so when they create opportunities and they control those opportunities, when they control the companies, when they control the wealth, they get to decide what the rules and the parameters are going to be. Uh, also, uh, remember, speaking of Farrakhan, Farrakhan's doing a, um, a speech on the 4th, 4th of July. I heard from the Nation of Islam. They asked me if they could simulcast the minister's speech in Michigan. Now, I can't make the speech. I wish I could. Uh, they asked, but they asked to simulcast it, um, you know, here uh, on our channel. And I said, absolutely. I completely support uh, the minister. I support the Nation of Islam. Now, what's interesting, though, is that Fox Soul, which is supposed to be a, uh, a, a, um, you know, a media outlet that's marketed to black people, they rejected Farrakhan. They basically got a call from, you know, from somebody who said he's a bad, he's a bad Negro. We don't want him to have any power. So they took him down. Now, I'm not saying you got to love Farrakhan or agree with everything he says. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that, you know, as you go through this process, you must understand that what, what you're being invited to receive right now when everyone suddenly loves black people is they're saying, come on in, come on in our house. We want to integrate you. We want to integrate you further into what we have going on. And I'm not saying integration is always a bad thing. You know, I'm saying integration was a failed experiment because the terms of the integration were not properly negotiated. You didn't properly negotiate the terms with which you be integrated and connected into white supremacist systems. Uh, so if you're not careful, you're gonna have a, just a repeat of what you had before. You're gonna have the second wave of the Negronavirus. This is gonna be the second wave of the Negronavirus where they made you into a bunch of low level Negroes who simply are there for uh, white people's pleasure. Meaning that you will come in and you will work for white companies and not build your own, uh, but you'll have a job. They're building wealth. They're, they're building generational wealth. You're getting a one generational job. They're getting multi-generational wealth you're getting a one generational job. You die at your desk because you're working so hard doing 80 hours a week because you want to impress them enough to get accolades and medals and butter biscuits. And they're passing something down to their children. You can't pass a job down to your kids. Uh, you know, so what I'm saying to you guys is that in this second wave, I'm not telling you not to participate. I think it's great. I think that there's a, a, a higher level of understanding of what is going on uh, you know, in, in terms of what black people really want, you know, I've had conversations with a lot of people. Uh, I talk, you know, I talked to some folks who who interview some of these political candidates, and their their discussions are headed in the right direction. Uh, but it's very very important that you don't do the hard that you make sure that you do the hard work. You don't skip out on the hard work necessary to build your own and to own your own. What do I mean specifically? Well, well, here's what I mean. Um, at the Black Business School, our Black Core of Three is very basic. It says Black people need to educate our own children. That means the support of independent Black-owned schools that are run by Black people that are designed to educate Black children to serve the Black community. It does not mean better public schools. That Sure, that's great, but that's not going to save the Black community. It does not mean schools run by white people with, with Black students in them. That those are designed to get federal money for, you know, from the government and using Black bodies to make money. Uh, black bodies are worth a lot of money. They were worth a lot of money during slavery. They're worth a lot of money today. So having extra black bodies is a, is a, is a, it can be a multi-million, multi-billion dollar operation. Just go ask the prison system. The more black bodies they have, the more money they make. Go ask the NCAA. The more black bodies they have, the more money they make. Go ask any failed school in America. The more black bodies they have, the more money they make. And what happens is that you get the Negronavirus of integration. What that Negronavirus does is it pushes you down to the lower tier of that, of, of that system. You become the, the basement infrastructure of a system that, in which whiteness rises to the top. So go to a lot of, uh, for example, go to a lot of universities where uh, at these white universities, they're like, oh, we love black people. We'll admit more black students, right? So that means you've got more and more black people coming into these schools, going into debt. I saw this at Syracuse University firsthand. At Syracuse University, every year, you have thousands of black students coming in, 
going deep into debt, into so much debt that they can never repay that debt. Most of the students I knew at Syracuse University many years ago that I used to teach have not repaid their student loans. And when you, but when you look at the leadership of the institution in terms of who's really benefiting from all that money, who's really running that campus, who's really making the decisions in that institution, that's where it gets wider and wider and wider. The higher you go up, the wider it gets, the further you go down, the darker it gets. And that's because for many years, black people have been a wonderful component to your infrastructure. They've been a wonderful little add on. They're wonderful tires for your car, right? So, uh, so what I'm trying to say to you is you, you don't just wanna be the tires of the car. You also wanna be maybe part of the engine. You also wanna get in the front seat and you wanna be the driver of the car. You wanna be the person whose name is on the title of that car. You wanna learn how to build your own car so that you can decide where that car is gonna go, how that car is gonna drive, let somebody else do the work. So, uh, so what does that mean? Black Core of Three in the Black Business School, we, Black people must educate our own children create our own jobs and support black businesses. So that means that we want more funding for independent black owned schools that are run by black educators, schools like Freedom Home Academy International in Chicago, where you've got black kids being educated at a very high level. I want that school to have a $100 million budget per year. Uh, you, you talk about creating our own jobs. The best employer for black people are other black people. The best employers for black people are black businesses. Black businesses run by black people with black employees and black communities. And maybe they can also take money from white people too in other communities as well. Then when I start seeing black businesses in Chinatown getting Chinese money, then I'll know we're making progress. When I know that you can set up a business in, in, in Little Italy and get that Italian money, then I know that we're making progress. When I know you can go over to the Hispanic side of town and get the Latino community supporting you the way we su might support them, then I know we're making progress. But right now, it's a one-sided equation. Right now, they come into Black communities. They set up shop. They suck out all the money like a vacuum cleaner, and they leave you broke, busted, and disgusted. <clears throat> black core of three, educate our own children, create our own jobs, support Black businesses. So that also means that last component, support Black business, means that that $1.3 trillion that runs through your pockets, it cannot just run through your pockets and run into the hands of white people. That $1.3 trillion, uh, that must be, you know, as much of that money as possible must be stored in the community. It must circulate in the community. But you have a responsibility in this process. This is not just white people. This is not you just screaming Black Lives Matter and begging white people to feel sorry for you and to stop doing what they're doing. <clears throat> it's a two-way street. Oppression is a two-way street. They have been beating you up and you've been standing there taking the punch. So what, what I'm saying is, that in order for us to overcome this oppression and in order for us to have this true economic liberation that I'm talking about, you must embrace the idea of actually taking ownership of your community. You must prepare yourself to take adequate ownership of your community. You must prepare your children to take advantage of opportunities. You must prepare your children to create opportunities. You must prepare your children to be able to identify opportunities. You can't have your children growing up and doing things like what Suge Knight and Tupac and <clears throat> Dr. Dre and Snoop did when they had death row records. Death row records should be a $100 billion company right now, but instead they weren't doing real business. They were doing <clears throat> Negro business. They were doing trifling business. They were doing idiot business, right? So, so the reality is that in order for you to benefit for a sh from a shift in white culture and a shift in American culture, you must create a shift in black culture. Now, I've been talking to you guys about this for, dec for the longest time. <clears throat> Finally, black folks are starting to listen. This decade is the first decade where I was actually able to get more black folks to really listen to me when I've been saying this stuff since back in the 1990s. I've been telling you guys that you must train your children to be business owners. Stop teaching your kids that the best way to get it to, to make money is to get a damn job. Stop talking about jobs. Stop teaching your kids how to play football and not teaching them nothing about how to run a business. Teach them how to play football after they learn how to run a business. Stop teaching your kids how to play basketball when they, they've never owned a single share of stock. You spend more money sending your daughter to cheerleading camp and to dance camp than you spend sending her to economic camp, business camp, investing camp. <clears throat> so, in order for us to really take this thing, you know, if you're really trying to get power, and let's say white folks are nice enough to grant you the ability to control institutions and to run your community, you must have the organizational skill to develop and to manage these institutions so you don't give it all away. <clears throat> the game of wealth, no matter how socialist people want to be, no matter how apologetic they want to be, no matter how egalitarian they want to pretend to be, no matter how polite they want to be, the game of economics is a competitive game. The game of economics is a competitive game, and you can't always get mad at somebody because they're smarter than you. 
You can't always get mad at somebody because they're more prepared than you. You can get sure you can be you can be upset. The world hates clever people. What do I mean by that? The world will get mad at you just because you you and your children are prepared and their children aren't prepared. So you and your children are prepared. So your children go do business with their children. Your children are prepared. Their children aren't. Your children know how to read, write, and do math. Their children don't. Your children know how to run a business. Their children don't. Your children know how to invest and build capital. Their children don't. So when your children do business with their children, then guess what? The, the intelligence rises to the top. Your children become the bosses and the CEOs and the millionaires. Their children are the workers, <clears throat> the employees, or the unemployed and the downtrodden. And then they want to turn and look at you and say, you lied to me. You cheated me. You're a dirtbag because, <clears throat> because you tricked me. Did nobody trick you? Nobody tricked you. You, you, they, I prepared, you didn't. Why are you mad at me? Because I worked hard to succeed. Let me just tell you a story. Then I'm going to shut this down. I'm going to stop talking about this because I want to answer some of your questions. I was in college. I was 19 years old. Some of you may have heard this story because uh, I've told it a couple of times, but not I don't tell it every day. So, but I'm, but it's appropriate for this moment. I was a 19 year old sophomore or junior at University of Kentucky, and I was uh, about to pledge a fraternity, uh, Omega Psi Phi. I was I was very close to pledging Omega Psi Phi. Now, let me tell you why I did not pledge Omega Sci-Fi. It is nothing, if you are a Q, this is no disrespect to you whatsoever. I looked at, I, I considered all the fraternities. I was invited to all the fraternities because I had the best grades on campus. I was the number one black student on the entire University of Kentucky campus. I had the highest grade point average of all the black students. So, so they didn't really want me because I was cool or, or I was fun to hang around. They wanted me because I, was, I would boost up their GPA. So I was kind of the Michael Jordan of, of academics, basically. So here's the deal. So I almost pledged to make a sci-fi because my roommate was a Q. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll be a Q. I'm one day away from pledging to make a sci-fi. And the reason I didn't pledge is because at the very last minute, I had a moment of clarity. You know, I, I, I came home and I saw the guys on our campus, you know, these guys were not Omega men, they were Q-dogs. They were not Omega men, they were Q-dogs. And they were sitting around, they was all sitting around drinking and just wasting time talking smack. Now I had just come back from the library because I was on my grind. I was about to get, I was trying to get mine. I was a hustler from the moment I believed in myself, from the moment I was 18 years old and believed I could accomplish something. I was 100% hustler, 100% hungry, always thinking about my dreams. You know, and I didn't have much support because I didn't have a lot of black male friends who understood that they thought I was too intense, you know, anyway. So I come home from the library. I see these dudes sitting around, they drinking, you know, just wasting time, <clears throat> ain't doing nothing productive. And I just looked at that and I said, you know, I really don't know if I want to be around this. You know, I, I, I then, you know, lift up my blanket. One of the guys was sitting on a shirt and I was like, why is he, he was sitting on my bed and he was sitting on a shirt. I said, why is he sitting on that shirt? You know, at first I'm thinking, why is he sitting on my bed? But I didn't care about that. I said, why is he sitting on his shirt? And I realized the reason he was sitting on the shirt is because he had spilled beer on my bed. And he threw uh, a blanket or just, he just grabbed a shirt and threw the shirt on top of the beer and just sat down, right? I didn't, now I don't drink. I don't mess with liquor. I have too many alcoholics in my family. I don't want no parts of that. Too many black men go to prison because of stupid stuff they did while they were high or drunk. The white man will destroy you if you're sitting around high and drunk. You can't be alert if you're high or drunk. A soldier can't be high or drunk. A soldier must be alert. So <clears throat> that's why I never mess with liquor. That's why to this day I don't. So I'm sitting there. I'm just like, man, this dude spilled beer on my bed and just sat on a shirt, you know? And, uh, and so they walked out and I just said to my roommate, I said, man, you know what? I thought about it. I don't, I don't think I want to do this, right? So the next day, apparently, I didn't think they'd care. I mean, who cares if I don't want to join your fraternity? You got a million people that want to be a Q, right? Well, apparently, this guy was offended. I guess they weren't used to being rejected. So this football player, a big bulky dude, much bigger than me, very intimidating, six foot three, 200 something pounds, football, he played on the football team. And he was really making some really snarky remarks, just really saying some really you know, rude shit, you know, like just, just being a jerk, you know, and, and I was like, why is this guy talking to me like that? You know, so I'm getting, eventually I'm kind of mad. I'm like, I'm like, you got a problem with me? And, and basically this dude thought that I was just, you know, a, a wimp because I didn't want to become a Q or whatever. And he was saying this and saying that about me. And so, so me, I've, I've always said what was on my mind, you know, like it, when I was little, my mother used to say, boy, your mouth will either make you great or get you killed. I'm curious to see which one. So I got mad. I said, I said, 
I said, what's your problem, man? You know, and I'm sitting there thinking in the back of my mind, like, whoa, this dude is big. He could, he could probably break me in half if he wanted to. But sometimes my mouth just starts going and I just, I figure out the consequences later. And I remember I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, I'm really annoyed with you. I said, you are a young black man who has an opportunity to get an education. And instead of studying and building for your future, you, you think you're going to go to the NFL or the NBA. I said, University of Kentucky football players don't go to the NFL. Your football team sucks. I said, y'all sit around, you drinking, smoking, messing with these nasty ass women, just any woman that walks through the door and you're wasting your opportunity. And I said, and you know what's going to happen? I said, in about 20 years, when I'm about 40, I said, some dude like you is going to get mad at me because I have money and he doesn't. He's going to get mad at me because I'm successful and he's not. You know, and, and I'm just I'm thinking, I was like, somebody, he's going he's gonna to get mad at me because, because my life is good and his life is crap when we had the same damn opportunity and you blew it because you too busy trying to be a low life piece of crap Negro. And I was trying to work hard and invest in my future so I could become somebody. And, and I remember he was like, he's like, I ain't going to be mad. I'm going to be in the NFL. I'm going to be fine. I said, man, you ain't going to make it to no NFL. Nobody from Kentucky goes to the NFL from the University of Kentucky football team. I mean, y'all, y'all, you, you can't even win a game in the SEC. So what are you talking about? And I remember that conversation because years later, that's exactly what happened. Years later, you know, when, when I have done, you know, the 12-hour the days, on, even on a Saturday night, when I have put in the blood, sweat, and tears, when I made the sacrifices, when I made all the investments, when I put in all the time to grind and to push and to be the best that I could be at what I did so I could be one of the best in the world at what I do today, I will run into people that will literally be mad because, because you're successful and they're not. Like literally, like 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 you took something from them. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but literally like, well, you know, you you don't know what it's like to be in a struggle. The hell I don't. I know the struggle better than you. That's why I work so hard to get out, right? So, so and what's the difference? The difference is that my daddy never allowed me to see myself as a victim. He never allowed me to see myself <clears throat> as the white man's punk. He never allowed me to see myself as somebody that was going to have to be lucky enough to be successful. He said, either you want it or you don't. Either you go get it or you sit on the sideline. And he also taught me, thank God I had a real father, you know, because so many people, so many of our people are misled in this victimhood thing. Like, 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 like you can get enough sympathy and enough charity for white people to actually elevate into true power. They, white folks will never give you power. They will never just hand it to you. It's never going to happen. The, the best you'll ever get is artificial power or paper power or fake power because nobody respects a person or a group that does not have the ability to handle their own business. So what I'm just telling you is the truth. You know, I don't really care how many uh, marches and rallies there are. I don't care how many times Netflix decides to make donations to HBCUs. I don't care how many uh, government policies are put in place. If you're not ready mentally to take advantage of opportunities to pursue them and to maintain them and to build upon them, and if you don't have the discipline to do that and the desire to do that, you're going to lose. I don't care how much opportunity the world creates for you. If you're not teaching and preparing your children to aim for the top, then they're going to find their way to the bottom. They are going to find their way to the bottom. Did you guys, have you guys ever seen this? There's a study actually that shows that because of this crazy, because of this culture, this, you know, this, this not just this, uh, this, uh, this, um, you know, this, this culture that teaches you to feel sorry for you, so this victim culture, but also, you know, what some parts of hip hop kind of did to the mind of the black male. Did you know that they found that even black boys who grow up in middle and upper class households were likely to end up poor? <laughs> likely to still like, like they would find their way to the bottom. And, and that's because if you have a bottom dweller mentality, then you're going to end up exactly where you're trying to go. You know, so, so I, I just encourage you to consider this as you make decisions for yourself and your family. When you have your children in your house, that is your castle, that is your kingdom, you decide whether they're going to be prepared or they're going to be unprepared. 
And that means that when you're talking about playing this economic game, there are specific and simple skills that wealthy people tend to understand that a lot of people do not. There are also distractions out here. And if you notice, if you watch me, if you listen to me on a regular basis, you'll know I don't get too caught up and all the emotional triggers that are dropped on you every single day in media. I pay attention, I'll talk about it, I'll respond to some of it, but when you look at what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, it always comes back to economics and education and preparation. I don't care what CNN just said on TV about Black Lives Matter or whatever, right? So, so, so mission critical, mission focus, that's what you must be. People who understand their mission and pursue that mission are the people who win in this world. Those who do not, do not win. Okay, so <clears throat> I uh, that was on my heart. I hope that that helped you guys uh, that are listening. I'm going to now answer questions, and I apologize for going into that, but that was really what I was thinking about, and I feel like that's the best way I can help you. Attitude is everything. So I want your attitude to be one of power. I want your attitude to be one of prosperity. I want your attitude to be one of ownership. I want your attitude to be one of investing. I want your attitude to be one of planting seeds. I want your attitude to be one of, 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 of never believing that anything's impossible for you uh, because everything that you ever want to do in your life is possible. You have to be willing to sacrifice in order to make it happen. All right. So <clears throat> anyway, um, by the way, so uh, some of you are asking about that code for the masterclass. Uh, you can go to drboycemasterclass.com if you want to join us July 8th. That's when the options masterclass starts. You go to drboycemasterclass.com. The code word is uh, July 2020. So if you use the code July 2020, it's all one word. You can get 48% off. So that code's available since you guys are listening today. So uh, drboycemasterclass.com. The code is July 2020, one word. Okay, so let's go. Let's go. All right. So Audrey, uh, do you need experience in stock or options to participate in the options, the stock options class? You do not need experience in either one to join the stock options class, Audrey. Um, uh, definitely not in options. Stock, you want to at least know the basics of you know why you want to own stock and things like that. Um, and uh, and I can answer some stock related questions as we talk about options. Uh, but uh, in general. Um, I don't think a person needs to understand stocks in order to understand options, but options are linked to stocks. Options are what they call derivative securities that are linked to the price of the stock. And so if you, um, so options are typically used to provide assistance in your stock strategy. So in a way you can think of the stock as Michael Jordan and think of the uh, options like Scotty Pippen. If you know anything about the Chicago Bulls, uh, Pippen wasn't as good of a player as Jordan, but Jordan couldn't win games without Pippen, right? Pippen was kind of the backup. So basically options allow you to back up your stock strategy. They allow you to um, uh, do a few things, uh, create income in your portfolio without having to sell your stock. They allow you to uh, manage your risk so you can reduce your risk of a downside, protect yourself against uh, losing money. They also allow you to scale up and participate in the upside. A lot of investing, a lot of the reason why you wanna be an investor in this country is because when you're in the game, you get a chance to participate in the upside. So uh, basically being a bad investor is actually far better than not investing at all. Even a bad investor at least has an opportunity to participate in the upside. If you don't invest at all, then you're basically spending all your money. Spending means there's no upside. Spending only has downside. Spending guarantees that your return on every investment is going to be about negative 100%. That means every time you go out to eat, negative 100%. Every time you go buy a new pair of Jordans, negative 100%. Every time you go on vacation, negative 100%. Well, at least with stocks, you get ownership in some sort of asset that has the possibility of going up in value. And that's why uh, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor because rich people on average tend to invest. That's why really the number one thing I want for everybody that watches me is I really want you to just take that time and go start buying stock. Uh, because if we increase the stock market participation rate in the black community, that will be a natural wealth accelerator for black people. Uh, let's see, Elijah, are there any examples of operating agreements for an investment group? Um, you know what? We're going to provide that. Uh, we're putting together the, the, the template for the investment clubs. Uh, we're meeting on that. Our teams are meeting on that about twice a week. And so we're going to launch, launch something soon uh, that will help you guys kind of get that moving. There's just some work we have to do in terms of working with lawyers and stuff like that. But we'll give you templates. We'll give you kind of everything that you need. So uh, give us some time. But we're almost done with the investment clubs. Uh, please comment on Blacking Bank, says Estelle, an aerial investment company. I just opened an account with One United. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Banking Black is, is very good. 
De it's definitely good for the black banks. Um, and I think that black banks deserve our support. Um, Ariel Capital, um, I know that I know John Rogers, well, I met him. And I had one meeting with him, though. So I don't know how much we know each other. But, uh, but I like the guy. And I think he's very smart. And I think he's worth listening to. And One United Bank, I don't know anybody at One United, but God bless him. I see them advertising a lot. Uh, Carletta, uh, pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Are fractional stocks a good strategy for long-term investing? Yes, because if you buy a fractional share, it's the same as buying um, an actual share for the most part. Fractional share is similar to actual share in the sense that you, um, you know, you're, you're participating in the growth of the stock. So if you have a stock like Amazon, that's $2,600 a share, uh, it, you know, fractional shares allow you to get in on the Amazon thing, you know, without having to put up 2,600 bucks. You can buy $10 worth of Amazon or, or $50 worth, you know, whatever you can afford. Uh, Latasha, I want to take your options masterclass, but I'm a beginner. I just finished your mini investment course. and really don't think I'm ready for trading options. What are your thoughts? Do you think I should take your masterclass investment or master investment class instead? Uh, well, Latasha, let me lay this out for you. Here's one thing that we offer you with every program in the Black Business School, just to make sure you're always making the right decision. We want you to make the right decision 100% of the time. And we never want you, we don't want a single nickel from you for anything unless you walk away feeling like you got 10 times more than what you pay for. So we have a 30 day 100% money back guarantee on every program. So that means if you join the class and you feel it's not for you, you can just email support at theblackbusinessschool.com and we have an excellent outstanding support team that will respond to you right away and will take good care of you and they will make it right. And so uh, there's no risk to you whatsoever. So um, I will say this, any question that you have, I designed the options masterclass in such a way where it's built for beginners. It's built literally in a way where I can explain this to an eight-year-old. And so, uh, so really, you know, you, you will understand options when, when the program's done, uh, even if you've never invested in stock before. <clears throat> and the reason uh, that I think the Black Business School, that we're good at what we do, is because um, as a finance professor, it's, it's a little bit different from being like, say, a financial expert or just a guy who read some books. You know, if, if we don't read the books, we write the books that, you know, and so basically by understanding the theory and understanding the intricacies and the subtleties of it on such a high level, I can explain it in a way where you'll actually understand that you've understood what options are since you were a little kid. Like I can take what you already know and say, oh, it's just like that. And you'll go, oh, okay, I get it now. Right. So that's one of the strengths that we have. And that's one of the things that I think makes the black business school very unique. And we do teach better than any university, HBCU, any Ivy League school that you've ever gone to, because we're uniquely designed to make sure that this is understandable, even to children. So feel free to come in, bring your kids, etc. The URL is drboycemasterclass.com. Uh, the code to get 48 percent off, <clears throat> it, it'll, it'll expire tomorrow. Uh, but the code is uh, July 2020. It's one word, one word, not two. Um, Maryland. Uh, old 401k is sitting but making money. Should I move it to an IRA or something else? <clears throat> um, I don't see any reason that, that you have to move it. Um, I, I, I think it's, if it's making money, you know, you have to sit there. If it's an account that you can keep contributing to, um, the key to building wealth is to be consistent. Remember, wealth is an accumulation process. I mean, something has to accumulate. So, <clears throat> you know, you have to just sort of just, even if you're not doing very much, just doing something small every week, every month on a consistent basis on autopilot is really how people become very wealthy. Like for example, the $5 a day plan that I gave you guys, you guys have access to that. If you don't, just email support at theblackbusinessschool.com and they can forward you a copy of my $5 a day ebook, which is totally free for you guys. It's on sale on Amazon, but don't, you don't have to buy it over there. Just uh, email, um, email support at theblackbusinessschool.com. They'll send it to you. And what it does is it explains how wealth accumulation works. Basically, you're just dropping little drips of money into your stock portfolio. And even if you don't know anything about stocks and you're literally randomly picking stocks, I, I kid you not, a five-year-old could be randomly picking stocks and just putting in their $5 a day. And that person's wealth will grow to almost, you know, to extremely well-defined amounts of money over a 10-year, 20-year, 30-year period. The thing that's hard to replace is time. The, you know, the time component is what makes the difference. That's why I really do my best to convince you guys to invest, you know, with your kids, to get your kids started early. Because if you get your kids started early and you get them on a consistent training program, 
financially speaking, meaning you're consistently dropping you know, small amounts of wealth into their portfolio, then it's very easy for that child to be extremely wealthy by the time they're in their 20s or their 30s, right? So, so just kind of you know, think about that. And, uh, and that's the best suggestion I, I can make to you guys. And put your questions in the, in the Q&A section. Uh, I can't see them if they're in the chat because there's, there's 40 questions in the question and answer section. So I'm, I want to try to get through those. Uh, Michael, please explain exchange traded funds. Um, an ETF is basically an exchange traded fund is basically something that indexes itself to um, or it connects itself to some sort of broad category of stocks. So for example, the, uh, the spider uh, ETF uh, is, is uh, for the S&P 500. So that basically links itself to the S&P 500, which means that when you buy the ETF, you're buying a little bit of every single stock in the S&P 500. Instead of having to go out and buy 500 individual stocks or pieces of stocks, you can just buy an ETF and an ETF will give you instant diversification. Like ETFs don't go bankrupt. A company can go bankrupt. An ETF won't go bankrupt because in order for an ETF to go bankrupt, then all the companies in the ETF would have to go bankrupt, which is a statistical impossibility, right? So ETFs are a great way to get instant diversification. Uh, let's see, I heard the government is buying bonds of large companies. How does this provide opportunities for us? Well, what this does uh, is when, when the government's intervening and they're buying bonds and stuff like that, <clears throat> remember that, you know, they can inject their financial medicine anywhere. Like the government can put their money anywhere they want. Um, but they tend to inject their financial medicine at the top. They inject their financial medicine into the financial markets. That's why I encourage you guys to be involved in the markets so that when they inject the money and inject the resources, you're going to be the first to benefit. Our country doesn't do enough for everybody and for rank and file people. And that's unfortunate. Um, but what is, 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 a, is an opportunity in America is that anybody can invest in the stock market. There is no <clears throat> whites only sign. There is no sign that says only rich people can do it. Um, there are apps that allow anybody with $10 in their account to get started. And so I encourage you guys to just sort of understand that the way to benefit from what the government's doing is to position yourself appropriately. And that's, that's sort of what this government intervention does. Um, so that URL for the masterclass, drboycemasterclass.com. That's the URL, drboycemasterclass.com. The code is July, 2020. That's one word, not two, July, 2020. If you want 48% off, we start July 8th. We're going to meet for six weeks at 8 PM uh, each Wednesday. And the recordings will be available. All the slides will be available. Everything will be available. And by the time you're done, you'll be, able to go in, jump in and use options to strengthen your portfolio. We will cover all the basics of options and how they work and the different types of options and the different, and then we're going to talk about the strategies. We're going to talk about the variables that move option prices and how they operate. And the cool thing is that because I understand it so well, I can explain it in ways that won't confuse you and throw you off because there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, these, what they call the Greeks, the Greek variables that can move option prices and it can be very complex, but there are ways to make it simple. And that's the goal. The goal is to make it really simple so we can then understand the complex. Okay. So, so let me, let me see here. All right. So the, what are SUSUs? Oh, wait, are what is called SUSUs a form of investment? Yes. A SUSU is a form of investment, but what you want to be careful about is that there are these things going around called blessing looms that they are, that are pretending to be susus. Um, a blessing loom is not a susu. A loom is like, they, they show you these little flowers and, and basically, um, unfortunately, according to the government, a loom is defined as a Ponzi scheme. So if somebody, if your friend says, oh, we got this group that's making money, you should join our group. And all you have to do is recruit two people, um, you know, behind you and they're going to put in money and then you get your chance to be in the middle and you get the blessing from everybody else. Um, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just going to say that you want to be careful for two reasons. One, Ponzi schemes, just for mathematical reasons, eventually must die. Ponzi schemes cannot last forever just because of the very nature, the way they are built, they eventually will fall apart and uh, people will lose money. But if you're willing to risk that, then it, it's up to you. The second piece is that, um, well, you, you'll probably annoy your friends by trying to get them to join in. Uh, that's another little tiny thing, like, you know, kind of like how um, a lot of the network marketers kind of drive their friends crazy, trying to get them to join um, the multi-level marketing thing. I don't know if you got friends that are like into multi-level. If you are in, in multi-level marketing, I don't want to, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings, but it's true. Like your friends probably run away from you. And you probably know that though, because you're smart. <clears throat> um, the third thing about it is, that if there's federal scrutiny, like if somebody gets mad and loses money and they go to the cops, um, you know, there's a chance because you're just involved or if you're recruiting people and actively participating and God forbid, you're the person who started the loom, 
um, you just never know what's going to happen, you know? And so I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying, be very careful. And a lot of people are marketing looms and saying that they are susus. A loom is not a susu. A susu is basically a savings group. It is, it, is, um, it is a structure that is designed to use peer pressure to get you to do something that you probably could do on your own, but you can do easier in a group. So a susu is where everybody contributes a certain amount of money on a regular basis and the money gets piled into a pot. And then at, at the end of so many weeks, everybody gets a big lump of money. So there's 10 of us. We all put hundred dollars a week in this pot and every 10 weeks, one of us gets a thousand dollars. That makes sense mathematically. Uh, and the reason that that's that a susu is legal and the loom is not is because a susu means that the, you get back what you put in. You're guaranteed to get back what you put in. In a loom, you're not, not so much. You're not guaranteed to get back what you put in, but your great country, your greatest contribution in a loom actually is the fact that you're bringing in two new people who are going to pay the old people at, you know, that are kind of in the middle of the loom. And there are people that will set up looms in a very manipulative way where they will basically set it up where they'll say, oh, go ahead and pay. And then when your turn comes, you'll get paid too. But then your turn never comes because there are people that set up looms deliberately in that way. So just be really careful with the looms. Or if you participate, I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, but the susus are fine. The susus don't grow your money though. That's one downside of a susu. Uh, but susus are kind of like, they kind of do what insurance companies do basically. Everybody pulls their money and then there's a pot of money. And, uh, and now there, you may get your money on a schedule in a susu, but I think a susu could be actually more effective if there was no schedule. If you simply just said, you know, we're just going to keep pulling our money. And if nobody ever needs any money, if nobody has a financial emergency, we're just going to let the pot keep growing. And then maybe you could take that money and actually invest it. Then you've elevated from a susu to an investment club in which your money actually grows and everybody actually is able to get more than they put in. But instead of getting it because they're recruiting, recruiting new members, you're getting more because you're actually growing your money through investment. Uh, Nana, uh, here from Philly. Okay, Nana, I got a Nana in my family. Our kid's grandmother's called Nana. Uh, <clears throat> my question is about suitable investments. What are they and should how should investors know about them? Um, you mean just suitable investments, things you should invest in? Uh, I would say, Nana, that well, st stocks are pretty safe if they're traded on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Um, those are good markets. You you know, you're not going to usually get ripped off in, in those cases. Um, if you're talking about doing real estate, um, I would get somebody to guide you through the deal because real estate, if you're a first timer, it's easy to lose money or to miss things that you might have caught if you were a more seasoned investor. Um, investing in somebody's business is a real risky thing because uh, that's an easy way to get ripped off. If they're controlling the money and they're making the decisions on whether or not you're going to know how much came in and all that stuff, it can become a real mess if you're dealing with somebody that you don't know. Um, you know, so I would encourage you to um, really, really vet people that have you invest in their small business and also use contracts to protect yourself. Uh, let's see, Linda, what time is Farrakhan speech? What's your channel? Thank you. Um, the channel we're going to put it on is uh, yourblackworldtv.com. That's yourblackworldtv.com. And uh, I don't know the time of the speech. Um, my producer is the person who's making the arrangements. So that part, I don't know. But if I find out, I'll, I'll let you guys know. I don't know when it's, I just told them they could, they could use the channel. I'm going to actually be in um, Atlanta. I'm going to go to, Jay Morrison is launching a uh, political party called the Black Rights Party. And I told him I, he has my full support. So I'm going to go down there for the launch of the party and I'm glad to participate. Michael Taylor, I'm purchasing my stock through a brokerage account on Fidelity instead of Acorn or TD Ameritrade. Is that good to do? Yeah, Fidelity is great. When I went to open up my account, uh, the account is referred to as a money market fund. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't put, I, yeah, money market funds don't grow very much. So, I mean, if you want your money to just sit still, then um, great. But if you want your money to grow, money market funds aren't the best way to do it. Uh, I'm a new student learning about stocks. It's good. It's going slow. And although I want to learn more about stock options, I'm not sure this is the right time. Why do you think I should take the class now? Well, you know, it's totally up to you in terms of what you feel comfortable doing. But uh, basically, I think that the I think that the greatest thing about the class, honestly, is that I'm good at teaching this stuff. That, that's you know, and I think that I can I I feel confident I can sit down and explain it to a ten year old. Um, and um, you know, it wouldn't even have to be a smart ten year old. You know. And so I, I, and I think it's a valuable tool to understand so that maybe as you're learning stocks, more and more about stocks, 
you understand how options fits into your investing strategy. So I think learning about options is, is just something valuable for an investor to do. And so um, feel free to go take a look. Uh, the URL, once again, for everybody who's, you know, who, who didn't get it, it's drboycemasterclass.com. That's drboycemasterclass.com. So feel free to go take a look. Um, let's see. Reinvest the money, says TD. I recently signed up for The Motley Fool. I think it's a good investment so far. But one of the key things they stress is always take cash from dividends instead of participating in the DRIPS, Dividend Reinvestment Program. I think this is to help ensure that you have some cash on hand. Um, you know, I, I reinvest my... Um, my dividends. Now, that's a preference thing. Some people want the cash. It's not that much cash. I mean, unless you're really, you know, use, unless you're buying a ton of stock and getting massive amounts of money through the dividends, you know, a lot of stocks like, you know, I don't know, you might have a stock where you might own $5,000 worth of the stock and your dividend payment might be like 50 bucks or something, right? Sure, $50 is $50, but it's not going to change your life. You know, if you if you're trying to really grow into, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, eventually in millions. So I think just letting it reinvest is fine. I, I don't think there's any reason why, because uh, you can get your cash elsewhere. Like if you have a job, you can get your cash from your job or again, well, or with options. Actually, with options, there are option strategies where you can generate cash from option strategies. So I wouldn't necessarily feel that you have to use your dividends for cash. Um, hello, Dr. Boyce. My, with this pandemic, how will... How will I create wealth in spending little money and which field uh, for you will be the best to begin? Um, how to create wealth by spending a little money. Um, I would learn how to be an entrepreneur. If you don't know how to start a business, I would go look and find some low cost way to learn the ins and outs of starting a business. Just know that the people that really know how to do this stuff really well are, you know, are usually going to charge you some money. But, you know, given that people will spend $100,000 going to college where most of the professors don't know anything about making money, um, I would encourage you to instead to consider uh, going online and finding somebody that's just really good at what they do, uh, a you know, program that has good reviews. Go ahead and make the investment. Just make sure they're going to give you what you want. Uh, maybe look for a money back guarantee and uh, and just dig in and learn and, and then commit yourself to that time, you know, that it takes to do that. Like, you know, don't sign up for something and then just not put any time into it. Like dig in, you know, like really just say, this is my number one priority. Pick one thing, you know, you have to pick your rocks. You know, there, there's, um to explain it, there's a book called Traction that I have my whole team read. And in Traction, they explain uh, the importance of picking quarterly rocks. And what does that mean? That means that you've got a million goals you could pursue. And if you're like me, um, I, I just swear I, I probably have ADHD and just never got diagnosed with it. I just use it as my superpower now because it gives me a lot of ideas. But, um, but one of the downsides of the ADHD is that I have a million ideas a minute. And when you have a million ideas a minute, you know, you just have so much stuff just coming out. And so, you know, so what I do to control that is I write my ideas down on paper. So I end up with just pages and pages of just chicken scratch of all these thoughts I have on the airplane while I'm driving the car, while I'm in the bathroom, while I'm walking through the hallway, whatever. And what I realized is that if I try to do all these things at once, I'm going to get nothing done. So I'm going to be exhausted and broke and struggling and nothing will get off the ground. So what I do instead is I give myself what they call quarterly rocks. I'll give myself rocks. I'll say, okay, all these ideas are great. I'm going to put them on paper and I'm going to leave them on paper until I finish what's in front of me. Right. And this is going to be my thing. So, so pick your thing. Pick your two or three things that you're going to do this month, this quarter, and that's it. And, and, and it doesn't mean you can't do other stuff, but you make those things mandatory and make the other stuff optional, right? Uh, you know, it, because if you don't, you'll go crazy. There's so much happening in the world. Your phone is buzzing and beeping. There's, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, Instagram, text message, emails, phone calls, everything. <clears throat> and it's, it, it will drive you insane. I don't know if anybody else goes through this, you know, but one of the first things I started doing when I really wanted to be productive is I turn my phone off. When I'm working, you can't call me when I'm working because I, I just, I just, mm, and I shut the door. I tell Alicia, I say, you are beautiful and I love you so much, but you, I don't need nobody coming up in here while I'm focusing. Right. And then um, on my part, what I'll do is <clears throat> I'll have like 10 things I want to do but I always know what those top two or three are going to be. So what I'll say to myself, the agreement I'll make with myself is, okay, boys, you can do all these other things, but after you do these things first, you must do these things first every day until they're done. <clears throat> and then you can pick another priority. So the reason they call them quarterly rocks is this. Imagine if you have, you have two, two, two things you can use. You have rocks and you have sand, 
right? Your rocks are your big goals. The sand is all the little stuff that gets in the way, all the little distractions that you have that, that, that keep you from accomplishing anything, right? So imagine if you filled up a glass full of sand, halfway up full, full of sand, and then you start putting rocks on top of the sand. Well, you can maybe get one or two rocks in there and then the glass will be full. You won't have any more space. But what they say to do instead is put the rocks in first so you can pile in three or four rocks and then you pour the sand in in between the rocks so the sand will fit in you know it'll get in where it fits in the sand will not be the top priority the rocks become the top priority so a lot of times the reason you don't accomplish the goals that you have for yourself in life is because you put the sand in front of the rocks you put the little things in front of the big things you let people distract you pull you away call you on the phone interrupt you all this other stuff and next thing you know you're you're reacting you're constantly reacting anybody ever go through that where you're just always reacting to stuff oh i gotta respond to this email oh i gotta answer this call oh i gotta follow and respond to this text oh my phone just beat right and, and and next thing you know your day's gone and you're exhausted and you got nothing done that was of any significant relevance to your life so what you have to do is put the rocks in front of the sand. So like, so for example, I'm very active on social media. I'm in there. I, I've always been in there. I love it, but I don't let social media interrupt my rocks. You know, I, 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 I'll be in there and I'll be tweeting and all kinds of stuff, but it's after I finish the things that matter, the things that are important. So figure out what's important to you and make sure that those things are first. And you're going to have to be a little rude. You're going to have to be, you have to downright disrespect people. I have to disrespect people that call me a thousand times and will just to talk to me for four or five minutes. It's like, no, one of my rocks is not just my work, but it's also my kids. Like I'm going to, I'm going to give time to my kids first. And then if I have some time and I'm not tired, then I might call you back. And, but if I'm tired, you might not get a call back till next January. And that's just what it is. Right? So make a decision, make a choice. You are important. You are significant. You must recognize your importance before the rest of the world will ever recognize any of that. Before I became Dr. Boyce Watkins, before I became an important man, air quotes, before I became significant to the world, I committed myself to being significant to me. So in my mind, back in 2004, when I was in my office, making no money, nobody knew who I was, nobody gave a damn, I said to myself, my time is as important as if I were the president of the United States, and that's because I am building something big. I am building something that is going to change the world, and nothing will get in front of that. So decide what matters to you and stick with that. Let me keep going. Mitchell, the Black Business School's intro to the stock market mini class is the best and will no doubt produce multimillionaires. All right, that's awesome, Mitchell. Thank you for saying that. My question is, do you still have that basketball you took with you back to Ohio State? You <laughs> okay, he's talking about the time where I, I, I could not pay my rent when I was 29 years old. The worst year of my life was 1999. Actually, I was 28. And uh, I, I, had, I, I had the trifecta of absolute misery. Um, my... Uh, my girlfriend had just dumped me for another man and uh, my career was not working out well. Um, I was struggling in my PhD program and I was broke, broke as a joke. I was so broke. I could not pay my rent. Like I was literally rock bottom, absolute worst time of my life. And I, I'm so thankful to God. I went through that because when you go through the misery, when you literally stare in, at the, in, in, you know, into the abyss and you're standing at the gates of hell, that's when you find your superpower. That's when you, that's when you get your opportunity to be great. I, I'm just telling you. So anyway, uh, that night I was moving out of my apartment. I had to sneak out cause I couldn't pay the rent. So I had to literally just break my lease. And uh, it was some old, you know, some old Italian guy or something. He wasn't old, but he, was, he wore a lot of jewelry and stuff. He, maybe his name was Vinny or something. I don't know. Anyway, so I just had to bounce. I had to go. And, uh, and I had enough money to rent one van going one way um, to go to Ohio because that's where I had a place to stay. So I packed everything in the middle of the night. I packed everything I had into this van and the van was so full that I, I realized I was like, I got to take my basketball because I love playing basketball. And so, and I was so full that I had nowhere in that van to put the basketball. So I literally had to drive to Ohio with my basketball on the dashboard and I had to hold it because I had nowhere else in the van to put the ball. It was the craziest thing. And so do I still have that ball? No, I do not. Thank God. And I don't thank God I don't have that life anymore. But yeah, if you, if you want to talk, if whatever, you know, whatever you're going through, um, just know that there, that this too shall pass. This is not all that there is. Um, your life 10 years from now will probably be very different from the life that you have now uh, because you're doing things right now that are going to make a huge difference in your life. And I wish I could go back in time and talk to that kid who was 28 years old going through it 
I would probably just say to him, just keep on keeping on, keep moving. You know, you're going to be okay. And, and fortunately, I did keep going. I, you know, I, I didn't let anything distract me too much or slow me down or make me give up. But I did it on faith. I didn't, I didn't do it because I just knew it was all going to work out at that time. I kind of thought it might, but I was in the darkness, you know, and in the darkness, you just keep moving forward and you hope you see the light eventually. And I wish I could go back in time and tell him, you know, have faith. You know, there is light at the end of that tunnel. Right. So I would just say to anybody in here that's that's in the darkness, you know, that's in the abyss, that's going through your personal hell, whatever, or your challenge, whatever it is, you know, have faith. There is light at the end of that tunnel. That's the best thing I can offer you as a so-called OG, as a 49 year old, is to say that, you know, your 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 life is a reflection of what you're committed to. So stay committed. You're, you, it's going to be good for you. You're going to it's going to work out. So, Jonathan, what are your thoughts on the Fed? And the quantitative easing, infinity supporting the stock market, and should we prepare ourselves in these markets during this critical time with so much going on? Um, I think that the Fed's uh, quantitative easing, meaning the Fed's decision to boost markets by, you know, buying corporate bonds and and uh, and providing all this liquidity that they're providing, that's kind of their playbook. Their playbook is to increase the money supply so that the economy can get, you know, stimulated again. Uh, it's not a bad idea. If they had done this during the Great Depression, the Great Depression wouldn't have been so great, uh, you know. And so, uh, rather than letting the depression be great again, uh, they're actually doing what I would what I would suggest they do. I think the problem is that these financial steroids become addictive, and so what happens is you create what is called moral hazard with uh, with the banks and with the Wall Street. Moral hazard um, means a lot of things, but one thing it means is basically that. If you know that you're not going to experience the consequences of your actions, then you're going to take more risks than you would if you were actually going to feel that pain. So it's like a teenager who is like, you know, you know, you know, teenagers are like, I want to be grown. I want to be grown. But then when something goes wrong or they got to pay their own bills or they crash their own car, they suddenly become kids again. They're like, oh, mom, I need your help. Dad, I need your help. Right. You're like, oh, but I thought you wanted to be grown. Right. And, and my parents, my, you know, my parents would tell me when I was a kid, they would say, look, if you go out here thinking you're grown and you get into a stupid situation, you're going to bail yourself out you will experience the consequences of your behavior. That was one of their models, right? But that's not the model of the federal government. So the model, so what the federal government tells Wall Street is, you know, if you go out and take all these crazy risks, you can get involved in all these complicated financial instruments, put all this money on the line. If you make money, good for you. You can, you know, make, you know, you can make a hundred million dollars a year, uh, you know, an individual, some of these hedge fund managers literally make over a billion dollars a year on, in their personal income. Uh, and then if things go bad, We'll come in and we'll save you. We'll, we'll come in and we'll bail you out. And a lot of people feel that that creates the wrong incentives. Uh, it makes them take more risk because they're like, oh, we're too big to fail now, right? So, and, and I, I, I personally think that's a problem. But the, pro the bigger problem is that if they don't bail them out, then you're talking about a prolonged downturn where jobs disappear forever and the entire country goes into another Great Depression. And I don't want that either. Uh, but I, I don't, I mean, but there's a point where you can't lower interest rates anymore. You can't keep increasing the money supply. You can't just increase the federal deficit, you know, another two, three, four, five, six trillion dollars, because eventually it's gonna the house of cards will fall down. That 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 is inevitable. But the the thing about it is you don't know when that's gonna be. And so that's why I still highly, I'm highly in favor of participating in the financial markets because that hasn't happened yet. Um, and so it, it could happen one day, but you can't just sort of sit around on the sidelines, not building wealth, waiting for the world to come to an end. You probably have those relatives who tell you that you're stupid for investing in the stock market because, oh, the global economy is going to collapse. The stock market is going to fall apart. It's all going to go to hell. And, 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 and people have been saying that for 120 years. And most of those people died broke. Most of them died broke. So, you know, keep moving, keep investing. I think that's the best approach. All right, how do you feel about gold, says Tim? I have some gold, it, nothing special about it. It's just there as a hedge against uh, inflation. When there's inflation and the value of the money starts to drop, the value of gold tends to go up because gold is a, a precious commodity. Uh, will the session be archived, says John? Yeah, I'm gonna put it in, um, those of you who are in uh, the Black Stock Market Program, you have access to Ask Dr. Boyce, which is a big archive of questions and Q and A's I've done over the years. It's really good. I mean, I think it's really good stuff. Like if you just wanna learn it and kind of ease into wealth building just by watching, just sitting back and passively listening. I think that's a great way to learn. And I, I do think I'm a, I'm a good enough teacher that um, you would benefit. If you sit there and you listen to me talk about this stuff for, you know, a few hours, 
you're going to be smarter when it comes to wealth than 90% of the population, probably more. So uh, feel free to go check it out. Um, ask Dr. Boyce. That's one of the curriculum things. Now, remember, if you're uh, part of the Investing Masterclass or the um, or uh, Black Money 102, the stock market class, you already have free access. Uh, but if you want to go get access, you can go over to the Black Business School and just talk to them and they can uh, show you how you, you can sign up and see everything that's there. Um, Sabrina, will you be covering transactions like puts and calls uh, in the options class? Yes, absolutely. Puts and calls, that's where it all begins. That's, that's that, you know, that, that's sort of the, the heaven and hell of options investing. That's where all conversations about options start with puts and calls. And then at that point, you build on top of that. And uh, so if you want to check out the masterclass, starts July 8th, you can go to drboycemasterclass.com, drboycemasterclass.com. What are things you look for when buying options? Um, you look for a lot of things. Um, you know, first you got to look at what, why you're buying options. Like, what are you looking for? What are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to reduce risk? Are you trying to make income? Are you trying to participate on the upside? Um, how much capital do you have? So there are a lot of variables that come into play in terms of how you play your option strategy. Uh, and, uh, so we, we're going to get into that in the masterclass, but there, there are a lot of variables and, and basically it's a matter of kind of knowing what tools are there, how to implement those tools and how to make sure they're implemented specifically to, uh, strengthen the portfolio that you have. Uh, remember, options are basically these instruments that are created to allow risk to be transferred from one party to another. So some people say, I, I want to take on more risk because I want to be paid to carry that risk, right? Some people say, I don't want the risk, so I will pay you to hold my risk. Some people, you know, want income. Some people want upside. Some people don't need so much upside. You can actually calibrate the amount of upside and the amount of downside that you get. And so there are basic option strategies I can break down for you, and we're going to do all that in the masterclass. Uh, hey, Dave from Orlando, just curious, boys, what's your physical address? Um, yeah, uh, you know what? I have a PO box and I don't know what it is. Um, email support at the black business school.com and they can give you the PO box. I, I just don't remember what it is. Um, obviously I can't give my home address cause people are crazy, but, uh, not that you're crazy. Just they're, you know, they're crazy people. And, um, but yeah, there is a PO box. And so if you email support at the black business school.com, they can get you the PO box. And also anybody who's in the black business school or thinking about adding a class or bring, joining with your kids. Um, I think we're great at educating kids. We, I really think, I'm serious. If you really want to have these super amazing children in the next generation, just subtly introduce them to wealth related concepts at an early age and just get them started now. It, it, and what will happen is it'll spark something in your kids. Like, especially a lot of the, the aggressive boys, like the same aggression that makes a little boy want to play football and go tackle people and run the ball down the field and score touchdowns is the same aggression that's going to make him want to buy stock and build wealth and start a business and make money. Like it's really the same type of energy. And so uh, the, the question is, what are they being introduced to at an early age? And if they get introduced to that, to investing at an early age, they may not even have a big interest in sports. They're going to, because that'll become their sport. Right. So uh, and, and, and for little girls, the reason that I believe wealth is important for girls or the reason that we teach our girls about wealth is because I basically tell them that financial abuse is real that there are people that will abuse you and take advantage of you and try to exploit you because they have money. I see it all the time. I know a lot of famous people. I know famous rappers and stuff and they have this money and they meet these people that have no money. And because they have money and the other person doesn't, then they, it creates an imbalance in, in the power of the relationship, which is a formula and a recipe for abuse. There are, you, you'd be amazed how many people won't leave a terrible relationship because they've never were taught by their parents how to provide for themselves financially. So I encourage you to get your kids started early. Um, you know, you guys know we have our Black Millionaires of Tomorrow program for children. That's the digital program. That's at blackmillionairesoftomorrow.com. We also have workbooks and flashcards for your kids. If you want to take a look, go to financialworkbooks.com. That's financialworkbooks.com. If somebody could type that in the chat so others can see it, I would appreciate it. We designed these with black educators. It took us two years to put them together. They're very good. Thousands of people are using them and they work extremely well. Um, I think when it comes to black education, the pandemic is a wonderful opportunity for us to just kind of take over all the systems that oppressed us. Uh, you're, you're home from work. Why not create a home-based business so you can stay home from work forever? Uh, your kids are home from school. Why not go ahead and educate your kids? You have me available. You have YouTube available. You've got all kinds of resources available. And, and at the end of the day, when it comes to education, a lot of the stuff that you learn in school, you don't even need. Seriously, how many of you took classes in, I don't know, like biology, you know, and, and, and learned a bunch of crap that you haven't even thought about since the 10th grade? I'm not saying if you're a biologist, then 
you, you don't count. But, you know, most of you, think about it. Think about how much crap you learned in school that has no value to you, you know, or learning. I, I took a class on Irish peasants when I was at University of Kentucky. What the hell do I need to know about Irish peasants? At what point have I used any of that in my everyday life or to feed my children or to do any of the things that matter to me as a black man? Not one single time. The only cool thing I learned from my Irish peasants class was I learned about a drink they had in, in, in old Ireland called bony clabber. And bony clabber was basically where you took some spoiled milk, you took some milk, you let it get nasty and spoiled, and you mixed it with cow's blood, and you stirred it. And for some reason, people drank that crap. That just tells you what kind of weird Neanderthal type people we're dealing with in America, right? I don't know why anybody would do that, but just know bony clabber wasn't created in Africa. And so anyway, that's the only thing I ever learned from that class. So why not take that time you might spend learning about you know, Irish peasants and bony clabber and take that time to learn how to buy a home. Hmm, maybe that'll come in handy. Or how to uh, invest for your financial security. Maybe that'll help. Or how to uh, get married and maintain the health of your relationship so that you can have a strong family, which allows you to build an institution on that family, a family bank, a family LLC, a family empire, right? Why not take the time that's wasted and make it productive? That's what, or learn taxes or, or how to balance your bank account, right? There are so many things that, that our children don't know. It'd be one thing if you're learning all the nonsense after you've learned all the dollars and cents. But the thing is that they take out the things you need to know and replace it with things that add no value whatsoever. So this is an opportunity, in my opinion, for you to take over the process. So I encourage you uh, to do that. The Black Business School is here to help. We have free homeschool training sessions uh, once a week. No Malenga Mushali Moses gets online and talks about how she homeschooled her kids. Her kids were getting all these bad reports from the teachers. They were telling her her son was doing this and doing that. And, and she, did, she didn't believe any of that because that's not who her son is. Her son doesn't have that nature. And so she just took her kids out. She quit her job, created an online business, and educates her kids at home, and now her kids are on their way to Harvard. They're the smartest kids I've ever seen. So just, just know that there is a better way. That's my, that's my two cents. All right, so let's see here. I'm enrolled in the stock options class, says Audrey. Another question, how much money do I need to get started in the stock options market? Not a lot, a little more than you need to invest in the, um, in the stock market, but it's not much more because there are different types of options that have different price levels depending on uh, you know, where the price is relative to what they call the strike price. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the options masterclass, but basically um, there are some really inexpensive options, but uh, there are also some that cost quite a bit. So uh, really uh, we can talk about that a little bit more uh, in the class, but in general, uh, you don't need a ton of money to invest in options. So that, that's the bottom line. Okay, let's see, James Farmer, in, in your options class, will you be discussing short sales and buying on margin? Absolutely. Uh, and that's where the Q&A comes in, right? So basically we have a curriculum. I lay out a bunch of stuff that you guys can, can watch it over and over and over again until it sinks in. And then all the things that you wanna know about or any questions that you have that go outside the scope of that, that's what Q&As are for. So I can fill in the void because this is the first time I've done an options masterclass. So the first time around, I'm gathering information in terms of helping you guys have exactly what you need. So you can tell me, you can say, hey, I'd like to know more about that or I'd like to know more, more about this. So since our goal is to make you as happy as possible, I will go and we will cover that if that's something that you'd like to know. All right, so let's see here. Um, are students from the Juneteenth Masterclass invited to join the class that begins on July 8th? Is there a fee? Yes, there is a fee, Nana, but uh, because you were in the Juneteenth Masterclass, you can get a massive discount. So if you go to uh, drboycemasterclass.com and use the code July2020, that's one word, not two, July2020, drboycemasterclass.com, you can get 48% off. That is not the price that is available to the general public at this time. Uh, people who go to the page now are going to get, uh, or the, their, their price is $549, yours drops to about $290. Okay, so uh, that's the benefit that you have because you were invited to this Q&A. Uh, just wanted to know your thoughts on Tesla's future, says Ajax. Uh, Tesla is a great company. Um, I heard recently that Elon Musk just congratulated his team on something amazing that they did. And uh, so the market's kind of buzzing about what this is gonna mean for the stock price. I gotta go take a look. I bought into Tesla because I love Elon Musk and his vision. Um, they're, they're, they're doing extremely well um, in their space. Uh, they've grown just by leaps and bounds. I mean, I can't believe this stock is over $1,000 and it used to trade for 17 bucks. That's kind of insane. 
And um, and I personally just think that Tesla has a bright future uh, because they're so far ahead of the game in the sense that they've, they've got, sure, they can make great cars and they're going to sell a lot of those, but they've also got th this whole battery business. And Musk says that the battery business could be as big as the car business, you know? And so I think Tesla has a lot of room to grow. The one big risk factor that I worry about with Tesla is that people don't live forever. So what if Elon Musk dies tomorrow? Um, that's going to kill the stock price. I'd be stunned if the stock price wasn't absolutely body slammed if Elon Musk died because he's the guy that's kind of driving all this. That's the only concern I have about Tesla. Outside of that, they're just doing a heck of a job. Um, let's see here. Eric says, Dr. Boyce, what do you consider to be good future stocks to invest? Um, you know, I, I like things that relate to the S&P 500, uh, broad indexes, you know, things like that. And, uh, and, and if you want to in the options class, we can get into futures as well, if that's something you want to talk about. Uh, have I ever heard of Wall, Black Wall Street 2.0? No, I have not, Akeem. Sorry, it sounds like an app. Um, I'll, I'll look it up, though. Lakeisha, with options trading, how are taxes handled on profits? Would this fall under capital gains? Yes, it would. And just like any other investment, there are short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains. So you don't want to get caught in a lot of short-term situations. That's why I want you to make sure you know the difference between an investor and a trader. A trader is not always an investor. A trader is someone who, you know, moves around from stock to stock or investment to investment, looking to buy low, sell high. Um, it's fine. I'm not, if you're a trader, I'm not in any way disrespecting what you do. But an investor is typically a person that plants a seed and lets it grow. Uh, investors get um, tax benefits that traders do not. And so um, when you're talking about taxes, taxes are important. If you do a lot of trading, you want to make sure you have an accountant that understands how to manage that for you in, uh, from a tax front. Uh, TD, what, why are some of the stocks on the NASDAQ, but not on the NYSE or any other? Or why are certain stocks on Robinhood, but perhaps not on Stash? Um, because Stash just chooses to list different stocks. In terms of the NASDAQ and NYSE, you can't be listed on both. They're just different criteria to be listed. The NASDAQ's criteria uh, are lower in terms of the amount of market cap you have to have to be listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, a lot of small tech companies will aim for the, for the NASDAQ, but there are also some big tech companies that end up on the NASDAQ as well. So the NASDAQ actually is doing extremely well right now uh, because these growth stocks, that's what tech companies are, growth stocks in the sense that their price earnings ratios are really high. Price earnings ratios is basically the price of the stock divided by earnings per share. Stocks with high price earnings ratios are called growth stocks because people expect the, the companies to grow like crazy, right? And so a lot of growth stocks tend to be in tech and a lot of those tech stocks tend to be on the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ is full of all these growth stocks. So right now the NASDAQ is absolutely at an insane level. It just passed a record high and is doing better than the NYSE. Is that going to continue? Nobody knows. But the danger of tech stocks that you have to be aware of, uh, or these, these growth stocks, high, high PE stocks, high price earnings ratio stocks. The danger is that what goes up comes down hard. You know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And so if there's, you know, a real heavy economic hit that happens in this economy, the tech stocks are going to be the, the biggest ones to burn and they're going to burn first. Okay. William Reed, what do you think is the best approach for investing every week or every month? Uh, invest a bunch of money when you think there's opportunity. Um, I think what they call dollar cost averaging, just consistent investing, have some money auto directed to your account. And then maybe once every week or two, you just go in and pick some stocks and just make sure you're well diversified and just be consistent. If a person just does that for, for a 20 or 30 year period, and they do, let's say they invest the amount of money that a person might spend normally on fast food, clothes and shoes and, and going to the mall or whatever, then that person would actually have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank uh, within a 20 or 30 year period. If you did that for your child, if you simply said right now, I have this baby, this baby's one years old, and I want this baby to be in a good shape in good shape by the time they're 30. So for the 30th birthday, I'm going to give them a big stock portfolio. And in between now and then, I'm going to basically take the amount of money I spend on fast food, and I'm going to match that amount uh, with by putting in that same amount in the stock portfolio. And I'm going to do that consistently and religiously. And I'm not going to sell anything. I'm just going to keep buying, buying and accumulating. And you do that consistently. Then by the time that child is 30, you're going to have about a quarter million dollars available to give that child. And that will be the best gift you can give that child because you're not just giving them money. You're giving them freedom. Uh, you're giving them uh, contentment, well-being, security. You're giving them the ability to tell their boss to kiss their ass. You're giving them the ability to go and start that business they want to start. You're giving them the ability to buy their first home. You're giving them the ability to get married and, and have a nice wedding and not go deep in debt. You're giving them the ability to go to school without going in debt, right? You're giving them a lot of things that go beyond the money, right? Uh, and that's the key idea with money. This is, again, this is me 
you know, given a personal philosophy, but I want to encourage you to not just think about money as this key to obtaining material possessions. Well, it's fine. You should want those things if that's what you like. That's okay. I'm not judging anything that you want to buy with your money. If you want to buy a helicopter like Kobe or whatever it is, that's up to you. It's no problem. But what's going to happen, I believe, is that once you get all the material stuff, once you get the nice house and the nice car, and you, you know, you've chartered a jet before, you've flown first class, then you're going to start needing something else that's going to fulfill you. You know, that's why you look at guys like Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, if I'm not mistaken, and Bill Gates, both of those guys, actually, if I'm not mistaken, have agreed to give away like 99% of their money, right? Because for them now, money is just, it's like, yeah, 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 we got plenty of money, right? Once you make your first few million, it's, it's kind of downhill. It's, I mean, you, what are you going to do, just buy a bigger house and a nicer car? I mean, it kind of gets stupid. That's why you see a lot of really wealthy people get really depressed and suicidal, or they get, start using drugs and everything else because they don't have anything else that's going to give them that high that they had when they were making money. Money is that original drug, and then eventually that drug wears out. And they replace it with other drugs, whether it's sex or, or real drugs, cocaine or whatever, right? So figure out, you know, what you're going to become when you actually have money, and, you know, because I, I really think you have to think about that. Because if you don't, you're going to one day wake up and realize you have no reason to get out of bed. You, you, you know, money is no longer a motivator anymore. And you're going to find something else that's going to motivate you. Okay. So anyway, let me keep going. Uh, Tim, what do you look at when buying stocks? Um, I like to buy things that analysts like. So if the majority of the analysts say that this is a good stock to buy, um, then I, I get in, I invest in that stock. Um, and then also sometimes I want stocks that pay dividends. Uh, dividend stocks don't grow very much, but that's good, you know, extra cash flow, income, things like that. Uh, and then sometimes I might want to just rebalance my portfolio. So I might say, you know, I don't have any exposure in China. Let me go buy a mutual fund that invests in China, right? So I don't want to do the guesswork. I don't want to figure out which Chinese company is going to be the big winner. I, I just will invest in a fund. I'll let the managers figure out which Chinese companies are the best ones to invest in. Uh, I'm not all that tech savvy and attempted to buy stock through your program with no luck. How do you go about buying stock? Um, you can buy stock with a lot of apps. The three big ones are Robinhood, Stash, or Acorn. Um, you can also use things like E-Trade, Ameritrade, Fidelity, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're in the program, if you're in one of the programs and you're having trouble buying stock, uh, email support at theblackbusinessschool.com and they can send you something that can get you, help you buy your first share of stock. Or if you go to firstsharestock.com, just go to firstsharestock.com and there's actually something there that will get you, that'll show you how to buy your first share of stock on TD Ameritrade. So feel free to go check that out too. Um, let's see, may someone over 65 invest in the stock market that's on a fixed income? Absolutely. Remember when you're over 65, you're not going to die tomorrow. So a lot of people think that because they're older that investing doesn't matter, that they shouldn't participate, it's stupid. And that's not true. Investing is something that you should do at any age uh, because remember when you're gone, you, what, you, what you accumulate, you, you can't take it with you. You're going to leave it for somebody, right? Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is when you're 65, your life expectancy has now risen to about 80 or 85. So that means you've got another 15, 20 years left on this earth. That makes you a long-term investor. Right? That's where uh, our wisdom in the Black Business School goes against conventional wisdom that you're going to find in a textbook. There are textbooks out there that'll tell you that when you get older, you want to minimize the risk because you don't have as much time to wait in case there's a market downturn. And some of that is true. But again, just because you're 65, that doesn't mean you're going to die tomorrow. Uh, when you look at uh, the, the cross section, uh, the, all 65 year olds in America, their life expectancy has risen just because they are the survivors. They have what they call survivorship bias. So these are the ones who made it to 65. So the fact that you made it to 65 means that now your life expectancy is no longer 72 or 73. It's like 80, 85, right? So basically here's the deal, right? So why do they tell older people to take less risk than younger people? Well, because older people have less time than younger people, right? So basically the argument that you'll read in a lot of textbooks is, well, if you're young and the market has a downturn, like it did during Corona, you can wait it out, you know, because you're 22. And by the time you're 23, 24, 25, the market will recover and you're fine. So a lot of risk gets annihilated simply because you're young and because you got plenty of time. Well, a 65 year old can also wait two years or three years. The average bear market lasts for 14 months. It lasts 14 months. That means that when you have a crash, like the Corona crash, you, you go down and then you sit and, and long-term investors just are like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to sit here and wait. I'm going to sit tight. 
I'm going to wait for it to stop raining. I'm going to wait for the sun to come back out because the sun always comes back out. There's no day where it starts raining ever in the history of the world. There's never been a day where it started raining and the sun didn't eventually come back out, right? So you're just like waiting, right? So you wait and you buy things while they're cheap and you wait and you wait and then eventually the sun comes back out. There's a recovery. You make a ton of money because you waited, because you did not panic. You didn't overreact. You didn't get stupid. Like a lot of stupid people will tell you, oh my God, the stock price market went down, so I sold everything. Well, that means that basically you're letting go at exactly the time you should be holding on the most, right? So ultimately the ability to just wait a year or two is pretty much the number one factor that will annihilate almost all of the risk that your relatives are warning you about when they tell you not to invest in the stock market. All of them tell you not to invest because they're all afraid of the crash. But if you wait for the crash to recover, then it's as if the crash never happened. You know, so look at the Corona situation. That's one example. So when the Corona crash happened, I looked at it, I looked around, I was like, okay, this is, this is interesting. Let's see what's going on. And, uh, and I made a lot of people mad, you know, but I'm okay with making them mad because I don't know all the answers. I'm not perfect. Maybe I'm wrong sometimes, but I'm not afraid to speak my truth. But then again, sometimes I'm right. In fact, most of the time I'm right. In fact, most of the people who criticize me the most are people who know less than me. I mean, I'm a 49 year old man with a PhD. So I'm, I'm, I, I understand this better than 99.9% .9 of all the people who criticize. So I don't have to pay that much attention to that, right? I not arrogantly, but I, I listen but then I say, ah, you'll understand this when you're older, right? So, so I watched what happened and I said, okay, wow, the market has plummeted. I'm going to go buy everything I can get my hands on. Do I know how long this crash is going to last? Let me research. Oh, the average bear market lasts about 14 months. Okay, so chances are we're going to wait about a year and a half and things are going to get better. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, so the market's reacting to uh, developments on a vaccine. Okay, well, eventually there will be a vaccine. It's not like five years from now, we won't have a corona vaccine. We're going to have one, right? So you know how the movie going to end, right? So because I knew how the movie was going to end, all I did was sit back and just wait it. Just said, okay, I'm just going to keep buying and just keep waiting. Okay. Now, here's what the Corona market did that surprised the hell out of me is I didn't have to wait 14 months to, to get the big payday. It took like three weeks, four weeks. Th this was the best quarter in the NYSE since 1987. There has not been a better quarter in the stock market since 1987. 1987, Dougie Fresh was a teenager, right? That's how long ago it was, right? So, 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 you know, but here's the thing. Even if it hadn't been a V-shaped recovery, that's what they call it. When it goes straight down, it comes straight up. You know, even if it was a U-shape where it stays down for a while and then comes back up or W-shape, it could still be a W-shape. The fact is that it, you know how the movie usually ends. In every single downturn in the history of this country, the movie has always ended with the good guy killing the bad guy. The movie always ends, you know, happily ever after, right? To this point, right? So, um, so that that's that's my thinking. Um, and uh, and I know I might have gave you more than you asked for, but that's what came to mind. So that's what I'm sharing with you because I believe this can help you. Um, a lot of times, if you the best thing, the best benefit I gained from reading you know, thousands of books and thousands of articles and writing research papers on the stock market and going through tons and tons of stock price data going back to you know, 1908 is that a lot of times what happens is once you go through all the complex, complex stuff, all the complexities and all the stuff that's designed to confuse you, all the long you know, four syllable words that financial experts say that make you feel like the market isn't for you, it actually goes back to simple things. It goes back to the monkey experiment done by Burton Malkiel in 1974, where he taught monkeys how to invest by throwing darts at a wall and found that monkeys are able to actually make more money investing badly like monkeys would invest. Monkeys can't invest. Monkeys can't do anything that humans can do, uh, at least when it comes to investing, right? But, but that monkeys can actually make more money than a human who doesn't invest. So literally people who are afraid to invest who sit on the sidelines because of fear or a lack of knowledge or because they're intimidated, unfortunately, they're going to do worse than a monkey would have done just by moving forward and just focusing on the simple things. So I'm going to teach you all the complex stuff. I'll break it all down for you. We can chop it up, look at it. I think it's important. I think it's important to digest it and understand it so you can really you know, feel comfortable with it as you move forward. But at the end of the day, the simple stuff is what's going to drive everything. The simple stuff is what drives wealth. 
the simple stuff is what's going to get you to the finish line. So just do the little stuff and that's what's going to get you there. Okay, so I'm done talking. I know there's 81 more questions in here. I wish I could answer them all. But uh, Alicia told me that I can only, I'm only allowed to talk for so long uh, because she makes me go upstairs and eat dinner. So I got to go upstairs and eat dinner because I got this beautiful black woman who loves to cook for me and she's also a PhD. And so I respect her intellect, but man, she can cook. And so um, I'm going to get out of here, guys. But I enjoyed talking to you. It was really my honor and pleasure to address you and speak with you. Um, I look forward to working with you and helping you and your family achieve all your goals. Uh, if you want to go take a look at the masterclass, I will give you the URL one more time. We start July. July 8th. That is, that is our options masterclass. First one we ever done, we've ever done. I'm excited. It's going to be great. So feel free to go to drboycemasterclass.com. That's drboycemasterclass.com. Because you're here, you can have that discount code that's not available anymore to the public. It's going to expire tomorrow. And the code is July 2020. July 2020, one word, not two. July 2020, put that code in and that will reduce uh, your tuition by 48%. So uh, if you're interested, come on in, bring your family, bring your cousin in uh, because we're going to have a blast and you're going to walk away so much smarter and so much more confident. And this is going to be uh, a great experience, I guarantee you. So uh, take care, guys. Have a good night. It was great talking to you and uh, thanks for listening. I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye-bye.